Well, we have Matthew here today on the Scroll Sessions podcast. Matthew Holman, we're excited to have you. I'm excited to be here too, guys. This is fun. <laughs> and uh, if you're curious how to approach him, guess. It's either Matthew or Matt and his response. Matty. It's going to dictate, yeah. you know, your future with him. You said big head earlier, so. I did. I, just depending, <laughs> like high school, I was Holman. You know, it's just mm. been different nicknames my whole life. So now I think I love I, it. I think I'm Matt because it's easier to type that back in an email. Yeah. So I like Matt. Awesome. It's quick. Yeah. It's, it's quick, easy. It's easy. It's two T's. Yes. Common. Yeah. Oh, there's some it. Matt's with one T. All so right. Are you one? He's no, he's no, two no, T no. Matt. Yeah, I'm two T. You could pick. In fact, there's there's the new name. Two T Matt. Two T Matt. Next time I see you, it's two T Matt. All right. Well, we're we're excited to have you on today. Um, how about you explain a little bit about who you are, what you do professionally right now, sure. and then we'll get into some of your background. But. Yeah, absolutely. So part of my, I do, I'm doing a, quite a few different things right now. Um, I'm the founder of Commerce Catalyst, which is an e-commerce and marketing community. I've got a Slack group of about 650 members, do um, lots of events, lunch and learns, um, things like that. And we can talk about how that kind of happened because it's kind of a fun yeah. story. Um, and then um, I do a lot of work with subscription brands and e-commerce. So um, the partnerships, I run partnerships at a subscription software company called QPilot, um, very much focused on delivery outcomes and inventory issues related to subscriptions. And then because of that, with all our own customers, and I love content and consulting and stuff, I do a lot of work through um, a brand we created um, called Subscription Prescription. So a newsletter, we actually just launched a podcast yesterday, cool. um, just talking about all things subscriptions, trying to help brands figure out how to do better get more recurring revenue in. Awesome. And do you have a full-time job and run uh, businesses on the side or businesses? So what you Cute Pilot was a full-time job up until just recently, but okay. because of a lot of the work that I've been doing with Commerce Catalyst and then also with where we want to go with subscription prescription is actually launching a community uh, within that um, under that brand as well to help brands like, you know, access resources and network and consult with other brands and stuff. So I'm, those are my new two like big projects that I'm working on: subscription, prescription, and commerce catalyst. Awesome. Yeah. So full time, your Econ. own boss. <laughs> yeah. At this yeah, yeah. point, yeah. pretty much. That's awesome. What cool. got you into like e-commerce? Like, what was the catalyst, so to speak, <laughs> to get yeah. you into e-commerce? I, I've always loved e-commerce just because for me, I feel like so. I love tech. Like, I, I'm one of those guys who nerds about about, about everything, like history, science, all yeah. the stuff. Like, I did theater growing up, a sports. Like, I'm all over the board. Yeah. And, for me, e-commerce though is like this, to me, it's it's this amazing intersection of technology, but innovation within technology and psychology, right? Buyer mm, behavior, yeah. like what's gonna motivate people? What do Goodbye. people want? And I think e-commerce is one of those spaces that's really, really fast at adapting to consumer trends and behaviors. Like the idea that you can shop on TikTok, right? The that's yeah. that's e-commerce. Yep. That is not anything else. And that's yeah. blowing my mind right yeah. now. The yeah. new TikTok shop. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're building that out more and more and getting feedback yeah. from users, from their merchants, just because they're trying to make that dollar transaction happen that much easier and faster. And that is what I love about e-commerce is that the innovation is just rampant, right the non, nonstop. Like if you look at B2B and stuff, which I do a lot of work with, I mean, B2B is a big, it's a massive, from a dollar value, it dwarfs anything in the B2C space, but yeah. it's slow. Mm -hmm. And the innovation there just yeah. takes time. There's, it's just a different breed of people and companies yep. doing that. Red tape on red tape. Yeah, exactly. And so within, e within e-com though, it's like, oh, hey, we just found out that Kizik implemented this new app that some guy out of like Germany just like released and it allows this transaction to happen twice as fast. Yeah. Boom. Everybody's Boom, using it. Yeah. yeah. And it's then crazy. somebody else will come in and disrupt that. So yeah, that's what I love about it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, before we get too uh, deep into all things e-commerce, let's talk about one marketing. I, I read a little bit on your LinkedIn that you got into marketing because a friend just needed help. Can you explain <laughs> like what led to you pursuing this, career and what did you do before all this yeah so i mean i think for a little bit more con context it's important to understand like i actually was incarcerated at 22 years old so um I, and i was incarcerated for, for quite a while so um for me my first job was actually in prison like i was a kid when i wow. went in my first real job i did some a few things before like landscaping stuff like that but my first real job was in prison where i got a job as a designer at a print shop a sign shop in there that they had lost I mean, that story actually 
I think I can, I can tell that story. So this story <laughs> yeah. is, hila- this is hilarious. So, <laughs> um, back when Katrina happened in 2005, um, the state of Utah put together a bunch of supplies to send out, out there to help support, um, okay. all the, you know, all the issues with re- mm-hmm. rebuilding and stuff like that. So the department of corrections assembled a bunch of stuff. They had a big truck that they're shipping out there and they, they printed out a big sticker cause they had a, you know, sticker sign department the shield showing the department of corrections. Yeah. So this truck drives all the way down to Katrina or all the way down to Louisiana. And the, the like, you know, head of the department of corrections out there calls the head of the department of corrections in Utah and says, Hey, we got your truck. Awesome. But why does it say department of corruptions on the badge? <laughs> oh, that's gosh. real. That is real. Oh, oh my god, hundred percent real. So a guy oh was just gosh. messing around, messing with the shield, thought yeah. it was funny to change corrections to corruptions gets printed and it nobody gets notices pr- yeah it gets, gets put on the truck nobody notices truck makes it all the way to louisiana somebody notices oh my so gosh. that guy got fired no kidding <laughs> and then they needed somebody to come in and figure out some of the design and printing stuff and my buddy was like hey matt will be great at it and i was like okay so that is why i got like a friend was like hey you can you come start. help us and it was a great job in prison it was uh i mean it, there weren't very many jobs where we could be using computers and yeah. like interfacing with customers and design and stuff like that so that's how i got started that was in 2005 wow. wait how did you hold a job while you were in prison no it was inside it was just, it was it was just part in, of yeah part so of the it. department of, like so most states and utah's got a pretty good program where they have um it's called the um let's see UCI, Utah Correctional Industries. So they have a plate plant where they make all the, li- all all the, the state license plates right. are made there. They do a lot of, fur- there's a furniture shop, uh, a print shop, a sign shop. Um, they were doing like data entry. Like even at one point before I got there, they were doing like cold calling for um, like, <laughs> like, telecom. like what was it before yeah. Angel Studios that like, like edited Bit uh, Angel? Maybe, I don't know if it was them specifically, yeah. but like they were people, they were calling and selling Huh, you know, edited videos and stuff yeah. like that. So really? yeah, wow. they've had a few different random things through there. So yeah, yeah. they have a pretty good, um, and the whole goal of that is one, it supplements the state, like, you know, the department of health, like gets all their printing down there, right? Like the yeah. department of education. Um, you know, I've designed logos for state departments and stuff like that because, um, and then it was a great opportunity for me. Cause when I got out, that's the job that I went for two years. I went and worked in a sign shop doing what I had done in prison. So yeah. it's a great way. It's like, it's a good, it's a great program. So did you get paid normally or what kind of pay do you? Anticipate? Yeah, I was making $4 an hour, Yeah, which in prison is actually a lot. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 That right. most guys, commissary. Most guys, yeah. yeah, you know the word. That's yeah. it. Is that, that is that exactly right. Yeah. So <laughs> most guys, uh, most people make a dollar an hour, or eighty cents, or sixty cents an hour. Yeah. So four dollars. I was making like four times over four times, really, the average. Wow. Yeah. Was, so you were popular because yeah, you could get all the goods. <laughs> yeah, could get all the goods. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, if you um, don't mind me asking, how long were you? Fifteen years. Wow. Yeah. Man. And of course, that's a like a very yeah. long story and yeah. a, a pretty. I mean, obviously, um, a lot that went into yeah. that, why I was there and yeah, what I sure. did and, and, and or didn't do and um, all the time I spent there. But yeah, so I got I went in at 22, very little wow. experience. Grew up in there, both yep. a lot of positive and negative things, um, you know. And then got out at 37. And so I had gone to school for a little while. Um, they had a bachelor's program through Utah State for a few years, and I got close. So when I got out, I had a lot of credits. I transferred to the University of Utah. So I was going to school those first two years, school full-time, working full-time, got a 4.0 at the U, got a you. degree in information systems. Yeah, I didn't want to go into marketing because I I was scared that I was going to be competing with a bunch of 25-year-olds who all yeah. knew how to do Snapchat better than I did. Yeah, you know? I get you. So I, I had a little bit of exposure to tech while I was in there, but not like, you know, I didn't have a Facebook account or anything like yeah. that. So it was a little overwhelming to feel like, and, and what I love about marketing is it, it was, didn't take too long till I realized that there's a lot of people who just did it weird or didn't know what they were really doing. And you, if you could be good at figuring out how to make something happen, you could be successful. It didn't matter, you know? So yeah. that's one of the things I love about marketing. Well, you know? what what was I – mean, it's a long time. Yeah, yeah. It's a long time to be out, out of the like, maybe realish world. Mm-hmm. How – like what is the – what's your – I guess, life experience from that experience that you've taken and learned from and are applying now in in your real life. And there's two really big things that I think the first that like fundamentally changed me as a human being was sitting like I'd only been in a few months. And again, my story is somewhat complicated. And I was sitting there thinking like, like, how are people going to judge me for what I did or didn't do? And how can I possibly judge somebody else 
just because of a newspaper clipping or what somebody said that they did, no matter what the crime, and I'm talking about uh, the yeah. whole gamut of crimes. Yeah. And that kind of like crystallized in my mind, like this idea of like empathy, like I don't understand like what other people's life stories are. Like there could be somebody who was a child molester who had been molested their whole life, who was in the state, like was um, in foster care, never had a chance. Yeah. And, and, what what do you do with somebody like that? Like, how do you judge somebody like that who has never had a chance and had horrible things happen to them, then do horrible things and now they're incarcerated, yeah. right? Like, how do you how? Do, so for me, it's like this really interesting perspective of if I, I don't know you, I'm going to try to give you the benefit of the doubt and I'm going to listen to you to tell me who you are, and try to ignore what other people say or do. And so my wife sometimes teases me because she'll meet some friends that I did time with and she'll like, oh, what did what did so and so do? I was like, oh, this, but I don't really know more than that. And she's like, what? Like, you never asked? I was like, yeah. they never didn't, brought it up. Yeah, it didn't come up. Yeah, this person was, from the person I met, was trying to be a good person. Mm -hmm. They had made mistakes. They had done serious things, obviously, and they're trying to be a good person. So that's the first thing was, like, just changing my view or lens of how I look at human beings, trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. Like, I'm wearing a Be Kind shirt because, for me, it's just, it's just that's the one thing we can control is how we interact with other people. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that's that was really, really impactful was, I don't take I don't take anything for granted. I mean that from like a knowledge standpoint. Like I'm I was I was a smart kid. I had a lot of good things going for me. I ended up in prison. And so the idea that I'm out here now trying to work and build businesses and try to help people, like I'm I don't take that an assumption that I know what I'm doing better than anybody else or that so for me what makes me kind of like lethal in a business standpoint is that I'm willing to learn like whatever and figure it out and talk to people and network yeah. and take advantage of that. And I don't have a bunch of hangups of how something was done 10 years ago because 10 years ago I was locked up. Yeah. So I don't have like a, a you don't prejudice. Have a frame of re reference. Yeah, I don't like, oh, back, you know, when yeah. people talk about like, oh, Facebook marketing back in 2015, I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. Like, I, I don't know. I, what, I, don't I don't know even what know what is. you're talking about. I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh my I read gosh. a blog about it. I don't know. Like, you know, yeah. I know people talk about it all the time. Like we had yeah. access to newspapers and magazines and stuff like that. Um, and I was in school, but it's not like I have an idea of like, oh, well, well, we did this campaign this way 10 years ago. It's like, no, like, let's go look at what's happening now, what's working now yeah. and trying to implement that. And then I think the final thing is I'm really good at connecting a lot of dots. Like yeah. that's just the way, what my brain is good at. Um, but yeah. So it's awesome. You, you were going to school while you were incarcerated. Yeah. Yeah. Where were you going to school? How did that work? They had a continuing education program through Utah State. So back like before um, the recession in 2007, there actually were locations, and they had still have some now. Where like Salt Lake, Vernal, um, you know, Saint George, some satellite Cedar locations. City. Yeah, yeah, satellite locations. So we actually were a satellite location at the prison in Draper and the prison in Gunnison, and a couple of the county jails had uh, satellite locations. So we'd be okay. sitting here on a mic, like with a little camera, and you could talk to. Actually, my cousin was going to classes in Salt Lake, and we were in like the same class together. But she was in Salt Lake, not yeah, not going to bed behind bars, and I was in yeah. wow. Draper going to a class. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and what kind of free time did you have? Because you worked, you went to school. Did you have? Yeah, we uh, yeah, there was lots of free time. I mean, they it's I I, I I should say like in general, like prison is not good, right? It's boring, it's horrible. There's bad stuff happening, like, but there are opportunities. You know, there's yard, there's gym. Um, here in Utah, they have a gr strong chapel program. Like, there's amazing volunteers from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who will come in and, like, do family history. They had a, actually a music school program where you could go and learn to play the guitar, the piano, like, be in a choir. Um, so there were a few things you could do. Um, you could have a, get a little TV. Um, so for me, it just depends because it's a long stretch of time. So there were times where I yeah. was not that active and kind of depressed. And there were times where I was like, you know, just trying to, really I picked active. up running around like 33, yeah. 34. And so I was just like, just running all the time. I would work. And at that point I wasn't going to school anymore. I would work, run, watch TV, go to sleep, you know, yeah. like yeah. NFL season was like the best thing because yeah. then you just knew <laughs> that Sundays you could watch t um, football all day. So, yeah. oh, anyway. wow. Yeah. Yeah. Sports in prison are pretty big. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. I don't doubt it. <laughs> it was like, it was like, where are you from? What did you do? Who's your football team? That was the three questions you would get asked by any t time you met anybody. <laughs> really? So who, uh, awesome. who was your football team? Who well, is your football the, the team? The funny story about that was I grew up in the Bay Area. So I would originally, I was like, eh, you know, I, I like grew up living college, like, and um, rooting for the Cougars, right? For BYU, yeah. even at the Bay Area. But I'd say, like, oh, I'm from the Bay Area. They're like, oh, you must be a, Niners fan or a Raiders yeah. fan. And at the time they were, that was early 2000s. Was, they were both pretty bad. Yeah. And I just be like, dude, I don't, I don't really care that much, <laughs> but people would get so like, 
Well, no, what's your team? What's your team? And so I started just picking, I started just saying the Cincinnati Bengals because they were the absolute worst so that people would be like, oh, I'm sorry, man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, so it was like it would like end the conversation because because yeah, I was yeah. so tired of people just like obsessing or I'm like, oh, I'm a Bengals fan. Well, so what happens is over time, like <laughs> it just I, I kind of like kind of like the Bengals. They had like uh, John Kitna quarterbacking <laughs> there, you know, like Marvin Lewis days, and then so yeah, so I'm a Bengals fan. There's certainly other teams that I root for or pull for as well, but yeah, I'm a Bengals fan, and now like. I mean, the last couple of years with Burrow have been pretty phenomenal. So yeah, <laughs> right. Awesome. Joe Burrow came in yeah. and changed them. Yeah. Changed the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so being an NFL fan and a college football fan, are you still a Cougars fan? Try to be. <laughs> um, I did graduate from the U. So yeah. you know, yeah. it's one of those things. In my, you know, my <laughs> wife is a graduate from there, and all her family is. And so it's one of those things where I, I, I want the, I want BYU to do well. Um, so I never really rooting against them unless they're playing like the youths or something like that. <laughs> Were there a lot of BYU fans in prison? Yeah. Was, really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's surprising. It's about where you grew up and who you were yeah, rooting yeah, for. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's okay. really kind of the more of it. But yeah, it would be kind of funny to see some guy who's like sleeve down, like yeah. gang banger, drugs, all the things. And he's like, go kooks, go kooks. Yeah. And you're just like, wow, this wow. is not sure this is what the university imagined as their fan base, but yeah. cool. But, hey, but that's good for, you, hey, good for them. Good for you, right? With all the things you learned in your your time in prison, and you said you mentioned empathy, right? right? You mentioned empathy and tr- obviously trying to better be a better human being. Uh, you know, uh, post incarceration. How, how have you taken those things and applied it now into business and your personal life? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I mean, I think for me, my my journey especially recently has been, you know, I'm, I, it, I have a little bit of paranoia at the back of my mind, somebody's going to judge me or for sure be turned off by, by my past. Right. Yeah. Um, and for a while I was kind of like warring on whether I should be open about that or not. And I think actually to give like shout out to, um, the people behind we are mind, right. Um, Nick Staggy, um, uh, Levi Lindsay, like those, those guys, like and Patrick Williams is a friend as well, like talking about mental health and and that vulnerability kind of gave me the courage to feel like, you know what, this might not be the best thing for me right now, but you know, so my LinkedIn byline has formerly incarcerated yeah. on it. And I posted about that. I don't talk about it necessarily a ton, but I had put out a post like, this is about me. Nobody, nobody knew like five years ago, I got out yeah. of prison kind of thing. And what's interesting is like a lot of people have come up to me and say like that has given them courage to talk about like dyslexia or um, their own past or their own running with the law or their own family and those things. And so it's sometimes it's hard because it's like, I might get dismissed or, or lose out on a business opportunity. And that's happened for the most part. It doesn't, but every once in a while I'll lose out a business opportunity because of it. And I, but the, the flip side is, is I can tell myself, Hey, I can help people through this way. Yeah. So my thing is I don't ever want anybody to make me uncomfortable because of me. Right. Like I don't like if, if you don't want me to be your speaker or your headline person because of my past, that's that's fine. Like you get to make choices for your own order, yeah. right? But at the same time, I am regularly trying to remind myself I'm choosing to be vulnerable, like right here on this podcast yeah. to talk about this because I hope that this can be beneficial to people. And hopefully you guys don't get flack and I don't get flack. Yeah. But even if you do, like the idea is like having these conversations are more real. And that for me, that's the those are the relationships that I really value. And so yeah. more of my job, like my job is trying to build community and finding that I actually have a talent for that and knack for that. For me, it's it's more innate. And I understand that better than just like digital marketing. And so yeah. leaning more into that and doing more of the community building Um so that's part of who I am, but that's also built a lot on, on understanding empathy. I think one of the funny th- jokes I like to make with guys that are getting out and trying to help them find jobs is you don't realize, but you're actually already a great networker because that's yeah. how you survived. Just yeah, finding that, out yeah. who knows what, 100%. who's got access to what, go talk to this person to get a job. <laughs> don't like, talk to that person. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> yeah, avoid yeah. this, you avoid have that, to know. you know. So, yeah, but the thing life. is you don't realize when you're getting out that that is actually how the world works. Yeah. Yeah. You get jobs. It's just a micro world. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So th- that idea of like understanding relationships and how to move things, how to actually like show up for people, you know, how to be accountable and like yeah. responsible and stuff. So anyway, that's I'm giving you really long answers to questions. Well, <laughs> I, well I think if you well, and like if you take it seriously and you want to survive, that is definitely the way to do it. And Absolutely. Like, yeah, jail, prison, or it's that microcosm of probably the worst part of the the like world. And what I mean by that is like the worst parts of 
who we are as human beings and hopefully that changes right and and some people change some people don't and i think you took that as i i need to change i'm going to change yeah i had and to and then you yeah. had to and and then you took that and brought it into the rest of uh, of your life mm-hmm. which is pretty amazing thanks man so so uh also you, it sounds like you do work with people that are getting out of prison still do you yeah, want to share a little bit about that yeah um when i I was at the school at the University of Utah, and I heard that University of Utah was launching like a prison education program to go in as volunteers and teach some college classes. And so I connected um, there with Dr. Aaron Castro, was starting that program. And for there, it was like a kind of a no-brainer to like, I was like, hey, how can I help? I can't go in, but let me teach you how to interact and what it's like. And then yeah. she's connected to me with people where for a really long time, I. You know, most people that have gone to college have, are aware of what a Pell Grant is. Um, but back in like the early 90s, um, they removed access for incarcerated people to access Pell Grant funding. And Pell Grants are interesting just because it's a, an expandable pool of money. So if like if you give a prisoner or an inmate a access to funds, it's not like, you know, your cousin going to school at, you know, UVU doesn't get access to Pell Grant funding now. It's just yeah. depending on how many people. So for... 30 something years, people didn't have access for it. And so I was part of a coalition of people that were going to DC to talk about my own experiences with education, mine and the lives of people I've seen, like 50 year olds who'd been in federal prison their entire lives, who had never had spent like maybe a couple of years out since they were 18, yeah. going to college, taking yeah. math mm-hmm. classes and seeing what that like ownership and like what that kind of like, I, I honestly believe that the biggest key to like lowering recidivism and changing our like a lot education. of this prison is, is education but all and and dreams giving somebody a, a reason to want more yeah and so yeah so i started doing a lot of work with their and nonprofits, and then i do a lot of work with um we've got a group here um uh, a utah reintegration project we're trying to help people with slick um salt lake community college you know just people getting out not sure what to do so hey i'm here talk about it like let's chat like I can give you interview advice, depending on what you do. Maybe I can connect you to somebody. Um, just trying to do what I can there. Just it's, it's really lonely when you get out. You've, even yeah. when you have support, it feels like just really overwhelming. Oh man. So, yeah. 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 Well, I, and I'm speaking out of uh, my wheelhouse here, but like something that I think about is when, when I look at the prison system or when anyone looks at the prison system, it's, and you see all these people that go, in you have to think about them coming out and don't we want change right like isn't that what we as a society are going for aren't we trying to forgive forget move on and create like a a positive change and i know that there were other countries even like sweden where they did music schools and things like that that really impacted and helped and uh i just think it's a forgotten piece often like talking about this today is all to me mind blowing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like you know. 95% of people that are incarcerated will be released one day. Do you want that wow. person to have an education and, uh, have worked on their yeah. anger management issues? Yeah. It's or like, would you rather they just hate the yeah. world? Yeah. Cause that's, that's what we're churning out right now. Yeah. Do you yeah. want it as a society? If you were to ask yourself the question, someone gets out of prison, what do you want them to do next? Right. Right. Do you want them to go back to prison or do you want them to learn how to fit into society and provide like this positive experience Mm -hmm. to the world? So I think it's really cool that you stay involved. And in a way, I think of like uh, the military, how people come home from the military and they struggle with PTSD. I'm sure even in prison, I'm sure a lot of PTSD comes from prison and to come out and have a support system of people who have been there has got to be huge and helpful. Yeah, I, I mean, when I meet vets, it's the same feeling of like wanting to try to help yeah. and do everything I can because while they chose to be in the military, right, like, different like, experience you know, like, for sure. Like they yeah. didn't make a mistake of being yeah. in the military, yeah. but still, it's hard and like reintegrating and being undervalued because of a label. I think yeah. another really big one is like single moms is in the same space because they were out of the workforce for a long time. And then because of divorce or change or something, they're re- they're they're going back in with a ten year gap. Like yeah. I was raised by a single mom, I married a single mom. For me, that's another um, group of people that I think are often undervalued, undervalue themselves, and yeah. are undervalued by society. And so, like I try to help them as much as possible too. Yeah, I, I yeah. mean, I think to myself, if I was labeled for the biggest mistakes I made in my life publicly, 
Is that would it be that haircut? Or <laughs> yeah, it, it would be. <laughs> it's no, longer than the gauntlet. Down, it's throwing the gauntlet. It's longer than it, it, it would was. be the attempt at a mustache <laughs> before before the hair. Hair's number two. Oh, I love it. Uh, if I was judged for every mistake uh, that I made or labeled for every mistake I made, I think we have to consider that as right. a society because yeah. prison isn't just full of all the most evil people in the world. Like there's well, no, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Well, that's why it's like cool. Like we were chatting earlier, like programs, like at least in Utah, the other side Academy, red barn Academy, um, programs outside of Utah, like Delancey street, which is based in the Bay area right. that are trying to give an alternative sentencing facility or other means that are way more productive than just going to prison. Absolutely. Right. And giving, um, these men and women chances to be productive members of society, be productive members for themselves first and then their community and then the surrounding, you know, uh, areas after that. It's, it's super positive and the impact that those organizations have had locally and, you know, uh, and throughout the United States are huge. And on that note, sticky bird in Farmington, yeah. if you're familiar with it, <laughs> It is 100% operated by the Red Barn. The Red Barn, and all of the employees there were formerly incarcerated. And it is the smoothest running operation. like restaurant great, great and operation. the best staff. Was yeah. it Sticky Bird? Yes. That yeah, called? Sticky Bird in Farmington I'll Station Park. So you have to check it out. But they like, out. I mean, both of them, like they they all have for profit entities to support the sure. the more or less non profit business. Um, but they, you know, they're all. Um, yeah, they've got the I know sticky well, Red Barn has Sticky Bird the restaurant, which is kind of a great chicken. Uh, yeah, yeah I love chicken, chicken, chicken so restaurant. So, so you know, it. chicken sandwiches, uh chicken fingers, stuff like that. Then they have uh the a thrift store, they've got a moving okay. company, they've got a working farm, and they also do they raise animals and you know, take care of the animals and sell I them off that. too. And, and similar operations for you know, other side and Delancey mm -hmm. street, they all have those supporting businesses, but graduates, most of them go on to either start working for the business side or become entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship. You know? And entrepreneurship's yep. huge. Like, I mean, I think most people would maybe recognize this name, maybe not, but like, uh, uh, Mike's killer bread. And that's probably like the classic example of like somebody who started a business after being incarcerated. And it's, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that. So it's a massive brand. But it, is. Wait. It's, it was started by somebody who was incarcerated. What? That's kind of the joke. Like, that's why it's called Mike's Killer Bread. And there's the you know, My wife big guy on the front bread. of the I logo. love that bread. Yeah. I'm so, gonna, yeah, you, you have to look support, it up you've now. You've been supporting me all along. You just didn't know it. You have to look yeah, it up now. Wow. That, that you should actually, cool. you, you have to listen to the, there was a um, How I Built This podcast. Okay. okay. And they interviewed the guy that started okay. it. And it's fascinating. Oh, my gosh. Really I'm going to go listen to but that. But very similar to like, people that have been to prison, been to jail, been incarcerated, you sometimes, and I think the best entrepreneurs too, you have sometimes have to hit the lowest of the low right. to in like, in order to like get your head right and focus. And you also have the comparison now, and now there's nothing left to lose. Mm -hmm. Like you have lost everything and now it's only up. It's a right? good reminder because days where it feels kind of hard or discouraging, it's like, yeah, I'm still way better off. And what's the worst thing that could happen to me is like, I, it's it's not that bad. <laughs> like, yeah, right. You get to yep. go home to a loving wife and family and things Super like lucky. you yeah. know like <laughs> that's a totally different scenario. So yeah, yeah. No, that's that's totally true. And in your case, do you feel like entrepreneurship was your only option, or did you feel like you had other? Yeah, options? It, it, it was. So when I was at the U, and and again, like I mentioned the the GPA because I was like, you know, you're killing it. I was killing it, yeah. and then I started to apply for places, and they were like, it's oh tough. wow. Yes. And then you get through all the way Your through and they and were like, yeah, background check. Sorry. Yeah. And some of those experiences were kind of negative. Like they, they just, just say they, no. They, well, some of, like one of one of them, a, a fairly prominent tech company or like they just ghosted me. Yeah. And then I know that happens in general, but it was like the interviews came so fast. They were so excited. And then it was like your background. Boom. Track and, on. and another one, another prominent tech company um, actually was really cool. They actually had like one of their head of legal, like talk to me about it and like, like to w walked it through and stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I appreciate you guys taking time to treat it's me like, as a human being. Yeah. I mean, that's totally. cool. And so, um, so yeah, I, I started applying for a few, few of those jobs when I was trying to get out of school. And, um, funny enough, I happened to run into a friend of mine who I actually had met while I was inside. He had b been in prison in Utah for some white collar crimes that we had kept in touch. And I was walking through Sugar House Park with my sister and run into 
my friend Gene with with his daughter and he's and we were catching up. He's yeah. like, Hey, you should come come check out what we're doing. Like yeah. we're trying to spin up a new department, like servicing some of our e commerce customers. Like you should come hang. And so I started working for them. And, and this so is a small business. What's that? Was this Q Cloud? Or this no, this is, is, no, this is this is eHub. This is eHub. E-Hub. Okay, yeah, okay. E-Hub. The amazing company. Um, yeah. That's actually where I met my wife. Like it's like that's a lot awesome. of like amazing things happen out of yeah. that. And I was working there, but that's when I kind of started to get this bug of like, do I want to be working for somebody else or do I want to be working for myself? Because I don't have a lot of control here. And it's yeah. also, also hard to like, you know, like if you've ever worked at a big company, you know, sometimes the frustration is like they want you to zig and I want to zag. Yeah, just, I think we should just zag, the red tape. You know? Yeah. It's like, it's like approval. You know, so <laughs> so what ended up happening was is uh, Landon Ainge, um, just the ultimate connector, would post it on LinkedIn. Like who wants to join a, 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 a e-com SaaS startup? as a marketing co-founder or whatever. And I was like, me? Sure. And interestingly enough, since Qpilot has got a very strong emphasis on shipping, I was had been working for a shipping company. So that was so a great end. And the funny thing you mentioned entrepreneurship was yeah. I go out to Denver and I'm meeting David. David Bradley is the founder of Qpilot. He's an amazing human being, one of my favorite people on the planet. We're getting to know each other and hanging out and um, we go out, you know, we go out to breakfast after a full day of talking and stuff. And he goes, look, man, I, I, I gotta tell you, like, cause at this point I'm like almost 40 or about, I'm yeah. about 40. He's like, I can't quite figure out why at 40 you're turning to entrepreneurship. <laughs> and so I said, uh, well, let me tell you a story. <laughs> so yeah. I told him the, I told him the, the much longer story. story and he was just, his, his immediate response. I will just, will never forget it. He's like, he's like, wow, well, you know, one of my first jobs was working for a moving company and almost everybody there had a felony. And then in my early 20s, I was working doing tech support for a company that would do micro loans to formerly incarcerated people in Texas. And he's like, now I get it. I get why yeah. you would want to be an entrepreneur. And I love it. And he's yeah. full, always embraced me and wanted my story to be part of the Qpilot story. Um, and so that's, yeah, that that's was like, awesome. and, that, and, and that's what's amazing about the entrepreneurship community is it's yeah. so much about adversity and trying to overcome some yeah. obstacle, implement some kind of change. So in many ways, entrepreneurship is like it's the not open saying, market. Yeah, and, and a lot of people are like, yeah. oh, cool. Yeah, like you know, I, I grew up in Africa and now I'm in the U.S. now, or yeah. I grew up here. I I you know worked in corporate for 20 years and got sick of it, so now I'm starting my own company. But good on you, you know. So yeah, I, yeah. So that was kind of the story of like where I went from school and at that sign company and and working with with eHub and their team and a lot of their projects, and then went the entrepreneurship route with Qpilot and. As a digital marketer, you know, it's hard working in bootstrap companies. And while I was there, um, I just wanted to do a little informal meetup with a couple of friends that I had made that were in marketing. So we just started doing these little breakfast groups like once a month yeah. just to talk like landing pages and like offers and mm-hmm. crap like that. Yeah. All, yeah. all that crap. All, 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 that crap. <laughs> <laughs> all the, all the and fun all stuff. That crap. It's all the fun stuff. So, you just start an LLC called and all, all, that, all crap. that crap. It's probably <laughs> taken, but I should look. <laughs> so, oh, that's um, awesome. so, uh, so we go, we, we go for a few months, you know, we like maybe take a picture, post it on LinkedIn. Like you want to come join us kind of thing. And then um, we did one with like, I started getting a few more people. So we would get like lunches. I thought breakfast would be more popular because it's before your day, but yeah. people, you know, kids, you don't want to get up that early or you can't get up, get out that early. Uh, so we started doing lunches and we started to get 10, 15 people. And then Patrick Williams was came to one and he's like, dude, you should do like a bigger thing. Like, this is really great. Because my whole thing was sit in a room, introduce yourself. What's your number one problem right now? Because you got 10 other marketers who are going to tell you like, Oh, you're looking at Kajabi? Like, oh, no, go do bubble. Mm -hmm. Why do you want this? Like, why? what's your objective here? Like, oh, this is how you create a social post and like all that stuff. And so it was really, really helpful. And so Patrick was like, this is awesome. You should do like a bigger thing. And I'm like, I I, I I don't know. I don't know how to do that. But I was at Kiln and Kiln is just amazing for empowering entrepreneurs. I told him, hey, I want to do like a big, I, I, I was doing a lunch event in their thing that they actually bought lunch for. I was like, hey, I want to do one in the big room. This is in Lehigh. And they're like, okay, cool. We'll sponsor it. And I was like, oh, okay, right. cool. So yeah. I invited like all of the most famous people I knew, which is like <laughs> Nick Staggy, uh, uh, Lindsay Ivy, Madeline Van Hoff, um, Bianca Collings, and um, Patrick Williams. You or maybe it was Lindsay Levi. Maybe it was, Le- maybe it was Le- everyone will show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe yeah, it was exactly. Levi instead of Bianca. I think Bianca might have been later, but um, yeah. And so I have them all on a panel. I was just asking questions. And yeah. <laughs> and the room was packed. 
Yeah. And, it, and, and again, I was thinking like the easiest social strategy on the planet is like invite a bunch of people with a stronger mm -hmm. following, create an <laughs> event, bright and ask them all to post about it once. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, but out of that, it's like my, my marketer brain was like, okay, well, if I have a bunch of people in a room, what am I going to do? Like, this isn't a business, but I should maybe like make like, it one. or push them somewhere. <laughs> so I'm yes. like, I start a Slack and I was like, Hey, Anybody that joins the Slack can like, we're going to do a random drawing. Like, oh yeah, it was Levi because uh, I said the winner gets a free hour with one of these five panelists. Oh, so awesome. it's like 20 people go join the Slack. Yeah, one of course. them's like, I want my hour with Levi Lindsay. Yeah. And then, um, the yeah, the rest is kind of history. So I just start doing like monthly meetups and then inviting people to come to the Slack. Like if the speaker had a slide deck. Yeah. You can get it in the Slack. And it was like it's the most basic marketing no, no, ever. Honestly, uh, running events is super fun. Yeah. It, it really is. Yeah. It like, and, and you're exactly right. I feel like the people you surround yourself with, especially when it comes to marketing an event, it's huge. It's everything. Yep. Yeah, they do. They do all the work for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, why we invite cool people on our podcast. <laughs> this is a cool podcast. Yeah. Period. So I do. I do. I do. I was really glad to to come on because yeah. you guys do a great job. Well, really and so tell us this like big transition. You went from eHub. Now, how did you get from eHub to now where you're at building these two e-commerce so, communities? And what were you doing exactly? Because digital marketing is so yeah, broad, Yeah, so I was right? leading marketing ever as a Qpilot, which means, you know, like we were running some ads for a while. Um, we were doing content creation. We would do outreach. What year um, was this? This was, so this was going to be like 2020, 2020, 20. And what kind of started. ads were you running? Uh, we were doing a little bit of Facebook and some LinkedIn. Okay. Um, we ultimately switched over to Google search just because like just capture bottom funnel, like yep. Yeah. It sometimes it's so maddening when you look back and think, why didn't I recognize that as an opportunity early on? But it's like we had a number, a, a big plugin that a lot of people would switch off of us on WooCommerce to to, to us. Oh, okay. And so we just started targeting that keyword, and like that that, that we helped. had a good lift from there, and then creating more content around that that key term because it's WooCommerce subscriptions was yeah. our competitor. So so that and so yeah, so I was doing that for well, really just up until just recently, and. And then also at the same time as a small company, we were bootstrapped. So it's like, I'm also doing partnerships, you know, I'm yeah. like head of growth, I think was my title. Yeah, it was my title. So it was like marketing and partnerships and revenue and and trying to figure out, you know, how to make the company grow. And, um, and I'm, I, I would say I'm a, I'm a good marketer. I'm not sure, like, you know, maybe somebody else in that situation could have like just blown the, the roof off of it. I don't know. Like, I, I don't want to like discount my time there as a marketer because, I just wonder, like, you know, maybe somebody else could have been better, right? It's yeah. like, so you, you did your best. <laughs> I did my best. Yeah, I worked yeah. hard. We we yeah. we worked hard. We're it's a great team. It's an amazing product. And and I think honestly, like, I think with where we are now, there's an amazing focus on the right type of content, the right type of partnerships, who we're going after and talking to. So it's actually really really exciting for us. And so even with me being a little bit less from a time perspective, less involved, I think it's going nowhere but up or continuing to go up. Um, but as I was doing like market, the, the first group was marketers unite was that Slack group and meetings and stuff. And then last year for about seven, eight months, I was, we had rolled that into ShareHouse, And so I helped launch ShareHouse with Madeline, um, yeah. and, and Wade is, um, my brother-in-law at that group. And so like, um, helping do a lot of that. And ultimately one of the things I learned there putting on events was I couldn't feel like a really strong tie back to my own business. Like we did an Amazon event in October and it was a ton of work. It was really hard. It was a great event. Half day. We had like 120, 130 people show up, paid tickets. Yeah. And at the end of it, I was like, wow, all this effort, like I could have done a subscription event and had 20 yeah. people there and it would have been more beneficial for me personally. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, I got to figure some of this out. And so, you know, um, ShareHouse continued to do what they're doing, the amazing VIP stuff. But then I was like, okay, I'm just going to do some. Do something else. I'm just going to do the commerce. I'm going to, I bring rebranded commerce catalyst. Thank you, chat GPT. Like it was yeah. the most amazing. <laughs> like I can't believe like, like it was literally like 10 minutes on AI finding chat, like commerce catalyst. That's like, awesome. And when I, cause I, cause my issue was like, I had marketers in the group initially and then I had e-com people. Yeah. How do I, what's the how name? Do I, that how do gets I bridge both? the gap? Yeah. yeah. And then I came up with some crappy logo off of an AI tool. Now our branding is done by the Grounded Company by Nick's team, yeah, which is just amazing. It looks great. Yeah. It's so cool. Um, when I did my first event with the new logo, mm -hmm. I took a picture. I was like, "Holy, holy crap! This looks this amazing. Real. It looks yeah. amazing on this giant screen. Like this <laughs> so is really, cool. really cool." So I was doing such a good so, feeling. Yeah, yeah. So I was doing that, and then, um, and then 
basically like this, like earlier this year, actually it was a converse. I, I've been thinking more and more like, I love this event stuff, this community stuff. Yeah. I need to do more of this. How do I get more involved in this? Because I'm not sure Q pilot has got community waiting to happen for it, which I'll come back to, but I've got this catalyst group. And then it was kind of one of those things where I was like, Hey, like accelerate puts on pattern, puts on this amazing event. Um, Brandless and Clark Capital put on an amazing event with Consumer Summit. Like, could could Catalyst, Commerce Catalyst, put on a great event yeah. with less resources and less people, but mm -hmm. just that whole tact of I'm just going to invite some really cool, smart people to speak. And and so what's funny is like people say like, wow, how'd you get so and so to speak? I was like, I, I sent him a DM I on just LinkedIn, or I asked somebody if they knew him and if they could make an intro and see <laughs> if they'd want to do it. And it's it's literally it's that, that fancy. It's literally that yeah. fancy. There's a spirit of like, I just want things to be helpful and useful. So. The panels are all like designed to like you're gonna learn something at I'm least excited. one thing. Yeah, it's it's gonna be amazing and 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 so that was yeah. So I went to my partner Dave and was like, hey, I've got to do more of this stuff, and it happened to be the right time for what Q Pilot needed more focus on partnerships because a lot of the content marketing is just kind of running, yeah. and um and I get to focus on that. And at the same time, what we did we started doing last year. Cause like nobody wants to read Q pilot newsletter on subscriptions, right? Like, or if you do, you're only using Q pilot, yeah. right? And so we rebranded it as subscription prescription. And we basically started saying like, Hey, we have, we have 250 customers. We have access to all their data. We know what works. Yeah. So let's just start writing about what works for everybody and not, and be, try to be platform agnostic as much as possible. Yeah. Like whether you're on recharge or whatever app you're using. And the newsletter has grown to like 2,000 subscribers. Like it's like done very it's well. It's very specific. Yeah. But it's very specific. And and it's like, hey, there's a big need for this because subscriptions are almost like one of the problems is if you're running retention at a brand like, you know, I mean, even a decent size doing 20, 30, maybe even 50 million, like there's most likely not somebody who's just over subscriptions. Yeah, It's their retention specialist that also manages subscriptions. And those people didn't go to school for subscriptions. Yeah. They only probably know what they know about subscriptions from the brand that they're currently working at, yeah. maybe one other brand before that. And so I'm just trying to facilitate like, you know, that knowledge same sharing. thing, knowledge, this is what's working. Hey, this is what this brand's doing. This is what we've seen work. And so that's the other thing is like, I just love that community. There's like, there's a lot of big plans we have there as well as some, we've been doing consulting and stuff too. Like, again, trying to be platform agnostic. So, so those are the two big passion projects now is, Catalyst doing events in the community stuff, and then subscription, prescription, podcast, community, which is right around the corner, and more content. So, so what are what are the pillars then to uh, keeping people retained and 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 building a subscription base? Yeah, so it's a it's a really great question. I think the that's the one I get a lot where people are like, "How do I decrease churn? Yeah, how do I keep people more?" And so like, and you guys are running an agency, you run in the same mm -hmm. problem, right? People leave for some reason. And I think what ultimately the, the, I try to put that, turn that question over on its head a little bit. And it's really comes back to trying to be better at understanding what they were expecting out of the subscription. Mm. And so it really comes back to acquisition. Like if you, and you guys know this, if you acquire yeah. somebody who doesn't really value your services or value like what type of marketing you do, they're not going to pay that price for that long. Mm -hmm. Even if it's working, they're going to be like, oh, well, anybody could probably do it. Or this is not that. So big I'm just going to go find something. They just don't get it. Right. And so. Cheaper. So you don't yeah. you want to find people who don't undervalue what you do. You want to have a clear pain point that you're answering, like like with any good service. Um, the other thing is just is comes coming down to an offer and understanding what people really want. And and a subscription is has the unfortunate thing of like you know you get that initial unboxing that's great maybe month one month two, you know month six is it are they still as excited? No. Right. So most subscriptions they start to decrease over time. So the idea is understanding why somebody came in. A great one is like, I take CBD to sleep. So, so when I sign up for a subscription, the first thing is, is that brand actually asking me like, why, why are you ordering this? Is it because yeah. of focus? Is it because of sleep? And if it is because of sleep, like I, I would love to see more brands ask like on a post-purchase survey, like, okay, it's sleep. Like what, how is lack of sleep cost? What is that costing in your life? Like, it's like, oh yeah, well I have really to take all this caffeine. Like I feel like I can't show up. I crash. Whatever the reasons may be, you get uncover that, and then suddenly it's like, oh, well, if I know this person's taking the CBD for sleep, yes, but they're sleep because they feel like they can't be as productive in their job, or maybe they're training for a, a marathon or something. Yeah. 
okay, well now that's the type of content that I use to remind somebody why they subscribe. And I go after more people that are looking for that as a solution because I'm getting clear signals from customers that this is what they're looking for. And so it's really just fine tuning that, that kind of marketing, that acquisition. And then what happens is, oh, well, if it's about energy and, and you yeah. don't like taking monster energy drinks to supplement it, like, well, here is a organic non-caffeinated energy supplement you can take during the day. And now you have a product you can upsell into your subscribers, yeah. right? You can boost that AOV, boost that lifetime value, and then also give people a reason to keep coming back to your brand. So that's like where the trick is. Understanding why people come in and then finding product or products and offers around that problem or problems to keep keep going. Hmm. I'm trying to think of subscription models that I have been subject you've, to. You've been you've and bought into <laughs> one that I always sign up for and always cancel is the <laughs> grocery uh, delivery delivery where they yeah. deliver meals. Uh, I forget what it's called, but um, just like meal, just like a meal planning. Yeah, like one. a meal delivery yeah. thing. Oh yeah, okay. Like a daily harvest up. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I always sign up for those because they have these really good initial offers right. and they'll send you like get freshly your, picked or yeah, yeah, your first six picked. meals. Yeah, that's keep but close. That's the keep close. close. Yeah. But there it's, there's one called yeah. something simple fresh, whatever. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I mean, so they're all fresh and yes. daily yeah. or yeah. yeah. But those guys I always sign up, I always end up canceling because the initial offer is so good and you're totally right. It's get your first six meals or your first six deliveries discounted. And then after that price goes up, but I know I'm going to get a letter in the mail or an email six <laughs> yeah. months later. That's like sign back up and get your, right. that same offer again. So in my eyes, it's like, well, you know that everyone's just working the system. So just offer that same offer forever. Just say sign up now and you get this discount Forever. Well, the trick, is, the trick is, so the beauty of a building a business like that is identifying the people that are going to keep doing that. Yeah. And, and, and some businesses freak out about that, which I think is a mistake. It's like, hey, we've had people who keep coming in and then they'll cancel and they'll come back. Just to get like, the offer. Just to get the offer. It's like, okay, are you worried? Is that, is, if that's like 80 or 90% of your business, then yeah, you've got a problem. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if that's 10 or 20% of your monthly like customers coming in, are you identifying the people that stick around forever? Yeah. The people mm -hmm. that really see the value. Because if it's just a, like, if that's just a top of funnel activity for them, I'm sure they're like taking a bath on like the cost of like acquiring customers like yeah. that. Like I, yeah. I've seen some of the numbers on those businesses and it can be a little bit ugly. It's really competitive and, it, oh, yeah. and, and be pretty costly. But the idea is yeah, if I can get people to try the offer, the, the, the real beautiful subscription programs are like, oh, you stick, you stuck around when we put this threshold in. Okay. Well, we, we have a, we have a really nice for offer that. for you. Yeah, like, we'll reward you. Or like, oh wow, you've been around for six months. Like, or really it's like two or three month periods, like, oh, we'll try this new this try this other product. And suddenly now you're ordering two, three things from them. Yeah, you know, like yeah. um, I interviewed um Caitlin Probst from Zao Nutrition, and they were talking a lot about this, where they sell a lot of just mundane supplements that you could potentially get anywhere, but they can bundle them. They have ones that they're very specific about that's like mm. um, proprietary to them. So it's like a stack for yeah, you. Yeah, so it's like a stack. It's like, hey, you come in, you might buy the vitamin C, but hey, we've got this like blue light yeah. pill to help you with like the headaches from blue light that you can take that you can't get on Amazon. Or like yeah. you might come in for the blue light. Well, here's the vitamin C. Here's the zinc. Here's the all the other stuff. So the idea is like finding, yeah, some people might come in, buy one thing. The example I always use, I'm a Dollar Shave Club guy. Bald, right? Mm, yeah. I don't buy anything else. I don't buy yeah. any of the upsells. If they sell me a free thing, I send me a free thing, I might use it. Now, I don't know if I'm the ideal customer for them or not. I've been yeah. on it for forever, as yeah. long as I've been out, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, I, my LTV is probably pretty high, but maybe I'm not the ideal customer that they market to where I don't try all the lotions and the aftershave and all the stuff, but, but they're trying. And that is the yeah. trick is it's like unlocking the more valuable ones. And so like in the agency world, it's the same thing. It's like, who can you find that needs more and more services? Mm. Right. Who as can you it, find? Like, scales is, is there some kind of signifier like where it's like, oh, when we run into somebody who's opening a bake shop in a densely populated area that's never run ads for, for us before, we know those are the customers that will make we'll make them ten million dollars and they'll make us a million dollars over the next two yeah. years. So it's like you, and that's hard. Obviously, I'm oversimplifying it, but that's kind of like how you start thinking about who's the ideal best customer for that subscription. And if the TAM on that, that if the market isn't big enough, then. Maybe you got to pivot, but that's the idea. Go after them, mm -hmm. figure that out, uncover more people like that. Um, anyway, I think of a good uh, example like my my wife and and we subscribe to like 
Walmart for grocery delivery. Yeah, we do. Serve. Like so, and it, and I think we'll probably have it forever because my wife doesn't particularly like walking in Walmart. I don't think most people do for the most part. And we <laughs> we have two small kids, right. so my wife doesn't want to go into the grocery store and try to lug around a baby plus a four year old in Walmart, right? And but the Walmart prices are good. And mm-hmm. so it, it's easier to just get those groceries delivered, even paying a little bit extra plus the monthly subscription. And they're, and we'll cru- never, they're crushing with oh, it right now. Yeah. And we'll probably never cancel that. Yeah. And, uh, but, and the nice thing is I think like, oh man, the grocery, uh, you know, Kroger and uh, the main, the main grocers and all of their subsidiaries just blew up with a pandemic and going to that model. Yeah. Cause I mean that, that was the catalyst for them to just, open everybody's eyes to how that was going to work. Cause I mean like DoorDash yeah. and everything, all that stuff was around Instacart. All that was around before the pandemic, but it was nowhere it near mainstream so far. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I just pushed it completely mainstream almost overnight, yeah. you know, until it was, it was a normal thing. That's about when we started and we don't plan on ever probably yeah. well, too convenient. canceling it to, to your point about identifying your customer, right? Like that subscription model doesn't work for me. Cause for me, mm-hmm. the grocery store is, date night because yeah. I don't have kids. Yeah, right. Right. So it's so easy yeah. for me and my wife to be like, well, we're not doing anything. Like we're just sitting here on our phones on TikTok. Let's so go let's to the go grocery store. Let's go. Exactly. And, and, and granted, exactly. my wife still loves shopping in person, but it's at very particular stores. Sure. Mm. Right. Like yeah. we go buy produce in person. We'll never like get produce to our house. Oh yeah. Um, Which makes just sense. Because my wife is a major But cook, dry so foods really are different. Specific. But dry foods and dry goods and all the other yeah. stuff that you don't want to go get. And yeah. you can get for cheap. You're not really examining the things of flour to see if they're fresh. Well, also, <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just can't trust what people are going to get. So there are some of those finicky things. But yeah, my wife's definitely an ideal customer for Walmart, though. Yeah, because sure. you have kids. So your wife's not sitting at home on TikTok doing nothing. She's taking home. She's taking yeah. care of two kids yeah. and needs groceries delivered to her. Right. We're like, so it's so interesting how two people, same age, the same demographic. Right. Uh, technically are being target could be targeted yeah. differently. One question I had on su- subscription based is uh, it, for retention is offense or defense more important? Like the question of, oh, don't cancel. We'll give you your next two months at a discount. Shopify does stuff like that. Yeah. Or, um, or the offense of like, you're not even assuming they're canceling. You're just offering them more stuff or you're offering them a deal at random. So I, I think it's actually something you can run at the same time. So the, the defense is probably a little bit easier. So the defense is like what's what we'd call like a cancellation survey or a win back campaign. So like um, I talk about on my podcast, like a tool called Upzello where, um, and there's there's quite a few tools that do this and some of them are native to the subscription app, but basically it's like somebody goes to click cancel and you're asking them like maybe a set of five reasons why. And the trick on that is like, if somebody's canceling because they hate your product, it does not matter what you offer. They're gone. Yeah, they're done. But if they're, if they're, if it's because like, maybe they have too much or like maybe they're not quite seeing the value. So it's like, Hey, we'll, we'll give you a little bit more. How about we give you a free month to, to get you to see if you like it still, you know, like, and, and the interesting thing is, is some of that is like, you're trying to incentivize somebody just to stick around a little longer to see if it works. Or maybe there's something you can offer that answers the reason why they wanted to cancel. Mm-hmm. And those ones can be really, really successful because a lot of times that person who was about to churn ends up sticking around for another six months. So yeah. you're like, not only that, that first month you might've given them free. Now that should all be data back. You can test with offers, but you don't want to just like start throwing away discounts left and right. You want to understand what's motivating people to stick around and yeah. whether those people are worth keeping in the first place. Right. The, the offense side is like, is understanding. And it's hard to do when you first launch subscriptions cause you don't have any data, but it's like, okay, where's the biggest drop-off points. It's obviously month one, month two, month three, maybe if I can get them to month four, that's the safe zone. So month one, I'm giving them a free gift because um, it's a sample or something like you're trying to improve the unboxing. Month two, maybe I'm giving a different gift or maybe it's month three. So you pick a point where you're going to start trying something. Like Obvi is a is an e-commerce brand. Like mm-hmm. they were doing A-B tests on free gifts, like to get somebody to stick around a month two. So the idea is you can start testing that to see if that can increase your retention rate. Um, the, the thing with that, though, is it can be difficult because if you're just giving discounts, like you might be serving the wrong type of customer. And so like I've heard people giving the first free month. Um, I mentioned Kate from, from Zao, like one thing they did that I thought was really cool is like you get your second month already free. 
So like you already end up you on the third month. It. Yeah, yeah. You know? So the idea is you're enough time to use the product. Um, the other thing would be then like understanding the other part of offense is again that question you're asking questions about why people come in and then you pay attention to the questions why people leave. Maybe it's a product issue. Maybe it's I have too much product. I always say you should always get into the why of why people have too much product. Is it too much product because your um, serving sizes are off? Is yeah. it because like the average person you're selling to actually doesn't use it as much as you think that they should? Is it because it's a new habit? So depending on what you one of those are, it's like, okay, well, um, we if need it's, to adjust it, our actual product or skews. Yeah, literally like athletic our, greens for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, it is not good enough to drink every day. <laughs> right. Like I will drink it twice <laughs> right. a week, but yeah. man, when you're telling me to drink it every day and I'm getting new things delivered, I'm like, this is too disgusting. I can't do this. Yeah. So the one that I really like is an example and athletic greens would be good. It's like, okay, well maybe on the product page, they need a little bit of a better, like, how often do you think you'll drink this? Or is it like, I think they intend it to drink every day. They do. Yeah. So maybe you're not, but maybe you're not ideal then, right? Like maybe you're the person who's going to slip through the cracks or they need to come up with something where you go to cancel. They'll say, Hey, how about you adjust mm -hmm. your frequency? How about you do it every yeah. other month instead of every month so that you can be happier with the product, right? Right. Um, yeah. And I would go for something like yeah. that. Yeah. And so that's the thing is like, that's how, why you think. Of, and so a lot of subscriptions is like you, you put something out there and then see what's working or not. And then you're trying to iterate and fix and a lot of times it's like, oh, I got to go improve my onboarding or the types of customers I'm acquiring because um, there needs to be a better fit with expectation. So how do you learn all this information? Like, where do you, I, I'm sure you talk about this on your <laughs> podcast, but like there, and there's tools. Do you have tools you recommend? Because how does a company doing thousand orders a day, 200 orders, orders a day, how do they learn all this information about their customer so Tri that they can be and, more? Trial and error. Yeah. Oh, like about their customer, like you want to use a post-purchase survey tool. So like, you know, here in Utah, we have Bestie. Is yeah. it, um, Trevor, Trevor and Mark. Yeah. Um, and then you. Besties. Yeah. And then uh, you're going to want a cancellation survey tool, right? So like I mentioned up Zello, but there's others um, that work that work well. And so you gather that data. Um, whatever subscription app you're using is going to have a data component, paying attention like cohorts, like people that subscribed last month, how do they perform next month, the month after, that yeah. kind of thing. So paying attention to that. Um and then a lot of it is testing, talking to customers. Like there's no, there's no overstating the importance of like getting qualitative data from talking to people. Yeah. Um, and then again, it comes down to like looking at your offer, what's working. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily easy. Um, but I, I find like with most e-commerce operators, like they're really good at like having an idea of what's happening. They might not always know why, and, but they're always good at like wanting to test something and pull a different lever and try something out. And so subscriptions are kind of the same thing. I think the mistake though is like you think that oh like I'm just gonna throw a discount out at I'm gonna just try this free gift kind of thing when it's like well if they don't like you the free gift isn't gonna work yeah. like maybe you can improve how you're selling so that they trust yeah. you more initially or yep. you know things like that make your decisions with data right exactly yeah always like so as far as uh, e-commerce brands knowing where to go next because I think a lot of e-commerce brands probably are using tools, but not using them efficiently. Is that right. common? Absolutely. Like Upzello, I, my best guess is if I own an e-commerce brand, we do run a subscription business, right? Like right. our yeah. business is all based on mm -hmm. subscriptions, but it's service-based. Our product is a service. Sure. Um, understanding our lifetime value, our churn rate. We were just talking about this at lunch yeah. with an, another person is very hard to understand. Right. Um, do you have any tools that you'd recommend for like a service-based company? Um, Bestie's one that we're trying to integrate a little bit more. Yeah, but. I, I would say like even something as simple as like using Typeform or something yeah. like that. Yeah, like, just a form. Yeah, like I think that <laughs> there's, I, I think for the most part, it's like the biggest problem is you you could use just a little more visibility into what's working or it's not. And then also I think expectation. So like as part of the onboarding process, like asking lots of questions or even like, I think a quiz is often a really great tactic with anybody, whether it's quiz, whether it's service-based or e-com, like understand like, oh, you come to the website, like why do you think you need help with SEO? Yeah. And and like if you can uncover a little bit about that better, it makes this process easier to sell, but also helps you understand like, and, and oftentimes it's like, hey, this ad is doing really, really well with people that think SEO is like this magic ser serum that like, transforms your business it's like oh no actually it takes more time so maybe you need to change yeah. the ad right like, yeah you know so that's where I, I would say like you should be looking at is like challenge a lot of those assumptions 
Um, discounts aren't uh, discounts can work, but that shouldn't be the end all. It should come down to your offer. And so, like with service based businesses, I, I think an interesting thing would be looking at like, so it's not a tool, but just a maybe a strategy is either implementing something that's higher value for higher value customers, so that you're not giving everybody the same service. So if you're charging five thousand dollars a month for these three things, or you know whatever set of the set of services is and you treat everybody the same, you run the risk of like the best customers walking out the door because you're not giving them. So if there's not a $10,000 a month package for double the meetings, right? Or like two project or, managers yeah. instead of one, like whatever <laughs> yeah, that is, whatever right? Is. You know, and then the alternative might be is like, oh, instead of the $5,000 a month option, there's, a, there's an entry level $500 a month where you get this one thing. Hmm. And then that way, maybe that's a channel for somebody to like, okay, I'm, I'm skeptical, but I'm gonna try this. And if it starts to work, you can build some report. And 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 same thing with like SaaS. That's how a lot of SaaSs work, right? It's like yeah, the free tiers. plan has some basic stuff, but and 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 they're happy with eighty percent of their user base being free because the twenty percent they unlock start to use the tool all the time and they pay tons of money for it. Yeah. So um, that's how I would think of like from a strategy perspective thinking it. Yeah, I really like that because I think that in our business we have run into this problem directly before where recently i think within three or four months ago dan had told a customer dan and i had been having a conversation about these low tier customers versus high tier customers and how obviously we want to treat everyone as equally as possible but someone paying us 10 grand versus 500 it it is different and dan had told the customer like they called him and he said i actually this isn't included you calling me isn't included in what you pay us to do and the guy lost it he got super upset <laughs> and it made us realize why is our service any different than a software, right? Like right. a software, you might not get all of the tools or even a customer support line right. if you're not yeah. on their premium package. And you know that going into it and it's all about expectations. They set that expectation by saying pick plan A, B, or C. C includes customer support. That's why it's more expensive. And plan A does not where I think that it made us kind of go back to the drawing board and say, could we build out some services that upfront set that expectation where we yeah. say it's not included here. L- let it me is assume, here. I would assume that your cus- your ideal customer is very similar to my ideal customer, which is like on the subscription side, which is when somebody's like looking to you as a partner, they're yeah. asking for your feedback on different things they want to try or do. They love working with you. They're feeding you information. One of them more integrated. Yeah, they're much more integrated. So mm-hmm. like the idea is like we recognize that with Qpilot. It's like, hey, when somebody, and I hate using the word partner in marketing because I think it's so <laughs> cheesy and so overused. But when I had a customer tell me that, they're like basically, they're like, look, we're looking for a partner. Can you be our partner? And I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I need a plan that emphasizes that where it's like maybe that higher tier plan is like, yeah, you get invited to Christmas dinner. Like that's how much we're integrated. You yeah. know what I mean? Like just because there are people that are going to be looking for that and you want to be able to capture those people more than worrying about the guy that gets mad because you don't have this included and now he's going to cancel or hate you. For, yeah. Like that's not a great customer. Yeah, right? no. And it, and it wasn't from it wasn't. the beginning. And I, and I think it's one of the reasons why we came up with our partner program. Maybe we need to change the name or maybe not, <laughs> but like our partner program was us being a lot more integrated. And we did the right. same thing. Like we looked at our best customers and this is what it always comes down to is you really need to understand your customer and we need to understand our customers better too. But I I think we came up with our partner program to have us be more integrated with our clients and vice versa. Like us being able to have the time because you're paying us a little bit more money for us to be able to understand your business in a bigger, better way, be more integrated so we can move the needle more and quicker. Right. Um, And so that that's where the partner program came into play. But the, it'll evolve and continue to get better. Clip that. That's an ad right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, but I agree. Like I, I feel like the clients that you can integrate with the best and the mm-hmm. most, and you know, the ones that um, are the ones that stick around the longest. Yeah. I do think it's funny when people say, can you be a partner? We're looking for a partner. <laughs> Absolutely. We can. It's going to be $10,000 a month, <laughs> right? Like yeah. to get that level of commitment from our staff, and yeah. that's kind of what we put together was the thought of like, 
in order for us to be as involved as we think you're going to need us to be like to do each platform, SEO, paid ads, web design for us to be that involved and on a call with you weekly and getting in the weeds, like this is the price point we're going to put on that. Absolutely. And, and they're like, and it's 2,500 okay. bucks a month starting. Okay. <laughs> Not 10 grand, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. should yeah. be 25,000. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, this has been really, really insightful. I think, awesome. uh, we should have, we should have a time where we have you come and help us learn how to be <laughs> better about our subscriptions because yeah. we just struggle. We're learning all the time. We're sure. young, we're young, dumb, and in love, and we're just trying to uh, <laughs> figure out how to build a good business. But we learn over time, yeah. right? Our lifetime value two years ago may have been three months. Where now it's right. a year. Right, right, so yeah. we're learning a lot, but. I think that's the biggest better. thing is like collecting some data, understanding things a little better, and then also like knowing yourself and what you're really good at. Cause that's the harder part sometimes. It's like, yeah, we want somebody who wants this, but it's like, but are this you? is the reason. Yeah. Right? This is why we do really well for somebody mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Absolutely. Well, I, Matthew, to, to end, I want you to plug a commerce uh, oh, yeah, yeah. catalyst. Um, because it's coming up. I right. hope we can release this episode. We're going to try yeah. to release this okay. episode before I was going to be out of town for that, but, but I canceled my flight. He's okay. Like, Just so I could come. <laughs> yeah. He's going to be there. But yeah, yeah. So, plug, so, plug it. So Commerce Catalyst is hosting an event, Co- Catalyst 23. It's for the year 23. This is actually the first year we're doing it. Uh, September 6th at the Mountain America Expo Center in Sandy. Uh, 8.30, we have about 20 sessions, um, 40 plus panelists on all aspects of running e-commerce business, whether you're talking about greater creative on ads, um, sourcing overseas, ops, um, loyalty programs, um, really the list goes on and on, AI and website content creation. Um, yeah, it, it, I've just tried to put together as many pieces as I could of the e-commerce puzzle with some of the best and brightest minds from from Utah because there's really just an yeah. amazing e-commerce scene here. I just love it. Yeah, oh it's, my really, gosh, it's, re- it's really cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm doing track A. So okay. that, okay. that's the track I think okay. I'm going to go on, right. but it's, it, I'm really he's excited. Guy. It's gonna be fun. I'm flipping out a session later. He's not going to know it. Yeah. But that's the track. I was like, that seems like the most interesting to me yeah. and what I can probably learn from the Absolutely. most. But anyways, it is a little it's random. It's a little risk. Like part of me is like, Oh, the non-focus aspect. Yeah. You know, everybody says you should always be focused, but I'm like, yeah. you know what? I want you to bring, if you got five people working for you at a brand, like all five should come. Because yeah. your email marketer will go into that session. Your yeah. sourcing person will be the person. Yep. You know what I mean? Like there should be a session for everybody there. And maybe, because honestly, who goes to every session anyway? Like all yeah. that track. Like you go to the ones you want to go to. So yeah, yeah. Anyway. I'm excited. It's going to be really cool. I'm starting a product company right now. Yeah. Now okay. that we've been doing a, a marketing agency for four years, I've learned a thing or two about how to grow. Right. Um, so this could be really, really insightful oh, for dude. me to know what to do yeah. next well we got to get you inside catalyst of slack so you can yes you do anytime you have a Plan problem you can i just redesigned my slack theme so okay. it's looking pretty cool <laughs> i like being in slack right now <laughs> awesome. Ooh, love awesome. it. well matthew where can people find you uh yeah linkedin matthew holman or um twitter i'm um, the subscription doc um yeah platform cool. x platform x yeah, yeah. Platform Excuse me. X. <laughs> elon's juggernaut I yeah exactly it. cool Cool. Awesome. Thank you again Absolutely for nice. coming on, Matthew. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.